This couple checked into a motel and found hidden cameras. What happens next will leave you shook. A few years ago, a not so happily married couple was driving home to see their family for the holidays. They were in the middle of nowhere when they almost hit a raccoon. It scared them so badly that they nearly veered off the road. Thankfully, the raccoon didn't want to press charges, so they continued on their way. Though, a few minutes later, the car engine started making noises. They were very loud, but didn't seem to be affecting the car's performance. The husband, David, told his wife, Amy, that it might be okay to just keep driving and see if things got better. Understandably, she wasn't happy with him, but was too tired to argue. They kept going for about 10 more minutes before the engine started making even louder noises. They had no choice but to pull over and inspect the issue. There was nowhere to stop except for an old, run-down gas station. The place looked like it had been abandoned for years. It was one of those places you only see in the movies, about serial killers or something. Hmm. Shortly after pulling in, a man suddenly appears by the window. The couple is startled, but all is well. He just wants to help. The mechanic, who happens to be moonlighting as a professional pyrotechnician, inspects the engine and finds nothing wrong with it. He declares it's safe to drive, but warns that the car will make a lot of noise. Yeah, I, I think they get that part. At some point during the inspection, the mechanic hands Amy a sparkler. Pyrotechnician, remember? She takes it and thanks him. David is surprised by her enthusiasm at receiving something she'll never use again. I, for one, love sparklers. The couple drives off. After a few miles of driving, David jokingly asks Amy if she's enjoying her cute little sparkler. She responds by throwing it out of the window. They argue for several minutes about how stupid it was to throw away an object they could have resold or perhaps recycled for all manner of artistic projects. A few minutes of bickering later, and the car stops abruptly in the middle of the road. Now what? It's getting dark, and this is literally as far from civilization as you can get. They can either do an impromptu camping session or walk back to the gas station. David decides to go ahead and walk back, and Amy follows shortly after. Upon arriving to the gas station, they see it's closed, but spot the motel next door. So they walk over. As they enter the establishment, they hear harrowing screams coming from behind the counter. What was that? Amy whispers nervously to David. He rings the bell, and out emerges a creepy man rocking a sussy stash, who seems delighted by their presence. The couple stares awkwardly at him until he realizes that his TV set is making them uncomfortable, so he turns it off. Can you call a mechanic? David asks. Our car broke down on the highway. The motel owner, Frank, knows he doesn't have any mechanics on hand, but he offers to point them in the right direction. Sure, there's a place 30 miles back that might still be open this late. You can use the payphone there. The payphone needs quarters, so David gets some change. And that's when things start getting weird. The man starts counting out change, excruciatingly slowly. The couple are getting more and more impatient by the second, but finally, David gets all his quarters and heads for the door. Oh, actually, now that I think about it, they're probably closed. Weird. The man then giddily adds that he, on the other hand, is open. Intrigued, but a little on edge about the idea of staying at a motel, David and Amy ultimately give in. It's only $5 extra for the honeymoon suite. Apparently, it has some extra perks the others don't. Amy insists on a regular room, but Frank pushes on the honeymoon suite. He smiles and hands them the keys at no extra cost. As David and Amy depart for the room, Frank looks on with a sinister gaze. David and Amy enter their motel room. It's filthy, but some critters call it home. Amy insists she'll be sleeping in her clothes tonight, and David adds he'll even be keeping his shoes on. Suddenly, there's a sharp knock at the door. They freeze and look at each other. David goes to take a closer look, but finds no one outside. Then, there's another knock. This one, louder and more insistent. Amy raises her eyebrows at David. That one sounded like it came from the side door. David walks slowly to the door and yells out, Who is it? There's no response. He looks to Amy. Her eyes are wide with fear. There's another knock at the front door, followed by an equally jarring one at the side door. David pounds loudly on it three times before yelling again. What do you want? There's no response. Amy implores him not to anger the ghosts, or whoever's doing this. Fine. Instead, he pays a visit to Frank. Oddly enough, Frank assures David that there are no other guests staying at the motel that night. He's not convinced and asks Frank to look into the matter. Frank agrees to do so, but believes that it's probably just a drunk guy making noise. However, David insists that Frank pull up, strapped. After David leaves, Frank grabs a gun from above the counter and has a sinister look on his face. Back in the motel room, David begins to unwind. The incessant knocking from the neighbors has stopped for now, but Amy is still nervous. She wants to go back to the car for the night, but David just wants to sleep. He decides to wind down with some TV. Unfortunately, static is not his cup of tea. No matter, he finds some VHS tapes lying around. Remember those? Unsure of what to expect, he pops one into the VCR and settles in for some entertainment. However, as he watches, a creeping feeling of terror crawls up his spine. The tapes are not your typical horror movies. They're poorly shot, raw, and unfiltered. They seem almost real. Wait a second. The room this is shot in looks awfully familiar. 
It quickly dawns on David and Amy that they are in fact witnessing a snuff film, recorded in the very room they're staying in. Their suspicions are confirmed when David spots a not so very carefully hidden camera. Now, he's no stranger to recording the bedroom. However, this is one step too far. Suddenly, the lights in the room flicker before going out. The couple is startled. The incessant knocking from earlier starts up again. Amy squeezes his hand. He squeezes back. The power goes off and on again as we catch a glimpse of a masked man in the bathroom. Amy is shook. The power returns and stays on this time, but the masked man is gone. Amy wants to leave immediately, but David suggests that they stay where they are. He suspects that the bad guys are outside waiting for them to exit their room, and so they have to find another way out. Perhaps the bathroom. Oh great, the window is nailed shut. Then, David spots an apple on the sink. It's half eaten, and it's Amy's favorite kind. Did you bring this? In fact, she didn't. Amy insists she left it in the car. At this point, the couple is utterly terrified. They've been trapped in the room for what feels like hours, but they know it's only been minutes. They have to come up with a plan to escape, quickly. David decides that the darkness of night could provide a cover for them if they run out now. After some hasty debate, the couple agrees to make a break for it and head into the night. However, they only make it a few yards before running into a masked man wielding a knife. They turn another direction, but yet again, a terrifying figure greets them. They flee back towards the room in a panic, but the door won't open. They struggle to get inside as the masked figures close in. At the last moment, the couple narrowly avoids certain death. Inside, Amy inspects the bathroom window once more, only to find another man peering in. They have nowhere left to go. They don't know what to do next until David realizes he has an idea. He'll run outside to the payphone, leaving his wife Amy by the window to distract the goons. David makes a run for it, successfully reaching the booth. He fumbles for the payphone, his fingers trembling with adrenaline as he dials 911. It rings once, twice, three times, before someone picks up and a deep, gruff voice answers. Police department. I'm trapped in a motel. They have knives. Help us. There's silence on the other end. David thinks he can hear breathing. <sighs> a whisper comes through the phone. Panicking won't help your odds. Frank, is that you? This is like a reverse prank call. Anyway, David hangs up the payphone and a truck suddenly speeds out from behind and slams into the booth. He barely manages to jump out of the way in time. Dazed, he makes his way back to the motel and bursts into his room, where Amy is waiting for him. I thought you were dead, she says breathlessly, throwing her arms around him. We're not yet, David says grimly before heading to the bathroom. He smashes the mirror and uses one of the shards to arm himself with a makeshift weapon. For a second there, I thought he just hated his reflection, which would have been relatable. The two sit on the floor together and wait. David's hand clenched around the glass shank, while Frank watches them on his security camera feed. Hours pass without incident until Amy falls asleep. When she wakes up again, she sees that David has been reviewing the footage of past victims on the TV, all of whom were blindsided by the sudden appearance of a man inside their room. He seems to enter from the bathroom, but how? It's almost like he's already in there. David has a look and finds a hidden trap door. But before he can investigate further, a truck pulls into the establishment. The couple watch from the window and see a man get out of the driver's seat. He heads towards the motel entrance. The couple shouts and bangs on the window to get his attention, but he doesn't seem to hear them. They continue their efforts until he spots them. Bingo. He begins to walk closer with a perplexed look on his face. Suddenly, masked men appear behind him. They get closer and closer, but he does not hear them. As they prepare to claim another victim, Frank appears and greets the man by name. Bill, been waiting for you. The good stuff's right here. The man is delighted at the news and snatches up the box of tapes eagerly. He casually makes his way back to his truck, but not before flashing one final, knowing gaze at the petrified couple. Left with no other option, the couple turns their attention back to the hidden door. David goes first, then Amy follows. The tunnel they find themselves in is cramped and dark. Amy starts to panic. She can't see anything. Then, she feels something brush her leg. It's rats. She screams at David to help her, but given their circumstances, this is the least of their worries. It's not long before they're past the rats and at the end of the tunnel. They discover a ladder that leads up into an office. David climbs up first, then helps Amy out of the tunnel. They ogle the assortment of TVs broadcasting views of all the rooms. Then, David checks the door to make sure it's safe for them to leave. He takes one peek and realizes they're at the front desk. We're no better off than we started. Amy is defeated, but quickly spots a glimmer of hope. A phone. She dials 911, but before she can even give a slither of information about their location or who's after them, Frank and his goons arrive. Where are they? Frank barks. He's upset that they've lost track of their targets. He enters the office where the couple was just moments before. He notices that they use the phone, rips out the phone line in anger, and shouts out a command to his goons. They're underground. They sprint off after their prey. Darkness closes in around the couple. They can hear the sound of their pursuers close behind them, crawling with a frenetic fervor. 
Moving at high speeds, they look like wild animals in their natural habitat. Meanwhile, the couple crawls as fast as they can, knowing that every corner they turn could be their last. The sounds get closer and closer, each one reverberating throughout the tunnel. David and Amy are exhausted, but they keep going faster and faster. Suddenly, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. A ladder. Amy looks back as David climbs it. The darkness greets her. It appears the tunnel dwellers have lost track of them. David reaches down and tugs her upward. She ascends into the dim light of another room. David barricades the door to the tunnel with a heavy desk while Amy catches her breath against the wall. They sit and reflect on the chaos they've faced so far. Strangely, this situation has brought them closer than they've been in years. I guess that's just one way to rekindle a marriage. Suddenly, a police car arrives at the motel. They must have traced Amy's call. Amy and David look out of the window and see the car pull up. Though, they're hesitant to make a move. They watch as Frank greets the police officer. The officer seems suspicious of Frank right away, asking several questions about his business and how long he's been in operation. Frank answers with a smile, trying not to seem nervous. He offers to show him around the place. The officer agrees. They walk towards a room and Frank goes to open a door, but stops short, claiming he has the wrong set of keys. I'm so sorry, officer. Frank stammers awkwardly. Let me go, gra let me go grab those keys. The cop stares at him coldly as he leaves, before having a go at the door. It opens. He enters the dark motel room, his flashlight scanning wildly. He hears a noise and turns toward it. The lights flick on and he's looking at a TV playing a snuff film. Meanwhile, David and Amy are fighting to stop the masked men from entering through the trap door. They must be really strong. Amy pauses to check on the officer. She sees him stumble out of the room, panicked, with gun in hand. As David is about to be overpowered, the couple instead decide to make a run for it. The cop spots them and he stops. His gun pointed at them. They both look terrified and disheveled but he can see that they're not the ones he's looking for. They're the victims. He lets them into his car, even lets them ride shotgun, but when he turns the key in the ignition, nothing happens. The engine has been sabotaged. Frankly, I saw that one coming. As the police officer checks out the engine, stupid move by the way, a masked man appears behind him and introduces him to his knife. The couple exit the car and run off into another motel room. Frank watches them flee, reflecting on the complications he could have avoided if he had just clapped that couple when he first saw them. Inside, David smashes a window, tears off a piece of Amy's shirt, and hangs it out the window. He instructs her to hide in the attic to bamboozle their attackers. Meanwhile, David plans to run to the front desk to get a gun. The moment he exits the door, he is stabbed. Amy muffles her screams from above. It appears her whimpers have gone unheard, but a long night awaits her. Amy awakens after night in the attic. She was starting to think it was all just a dream, but that hope is nipped in the bud when she peers down and sees her husband's feet just below. He's laying dead on the ground. As Amy hops out, a masked man appears from behind. His patience to wait is as commendable as it is terrifying. As Amy runs off, the goon makes chase. She spots a car and manages to hijack it. Calling upon her inner GTA, she runs over her attackers. Goddamn. Frank makes it to the scene. Despair fills his body. Amy is already gone, making her way back to the front desk to call the coppers again. Unfortunately, the phone line is gone, so she decides to arm herself with a hammer before her eyes fall upon a gun. While desperately reaching for the weapon, Frank appears suddenly and knocks the gun away from her. He grabs her and they struggle back and forth until Amy is knocked down next to the gun. Uh oh. As soon as she feels it hit her hand, she grabs it just in time, shooting Frank twice before he can fire off his own attack. Right after, she checks on her husband and finds he's still alive but barely breathing. She goes back to Frank's body, retrieves the phone line, and calls for help. Our story ends with Amy holding David dearly as they await help. Moral of the story? There's more than one way to save a marriage. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, especially you, Jacob.